Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and this is part number three of the big cleanup of the David Brown and we're going to be looking at the electrical system. So we will be looking at the dashboard, the dials, the indicators and the gauges, the switches and the control lights, what they are used for, how they work and how you can test them and how you can repair them. And as you can see I already took the dashboard off. It's not a big deal to take it off, it's only two bolts and one on each side and then you kind of lift it up but you have to remove the lever for the throttle. Uh, that's the only thing you need to remove. And here is our dashboard that we took off the tractor and I'm going to go through the dashboard with you first of all on the controls that we have, then on the gauges, then we're going to take it apart actually because we want to check every individual gauge on if it still works or not and see what we need to adjust or to align or whatever. And then we're going to check the functions of all the different switches and um, the lights here and the circuitry involved and I will take you through the different circuits and how they operate. So this might be a little bit boring if you don't like theory guys then, then just skip this but it's important uh, if you're going to restore your tractor and if you want to make sure that all the electrical circuits are working properly because those gauges have a good function. The same thing for these warning lights and even the missing warning. Your dashboard might look a little bit different, but in essence, you've got the horn, you got the blinker indicator left and right. You got some control switches for lights. So uh, for instance, an aid light in the back, then you have a fuel gauge, you have a temperature gauge. You've got a oil warning light, you've got a charge light, and you have the hydraulics warning light, and then you have your RPM and hour counter. And all the way on the right hand side, you have your light switch to select high beams, low beams, and whatever. So you have like three positions on that. And of course, you have the contact here to place the contact on, and then to start it, which is spring loaded that returns. So this is all there is to the dashboard, not a lot. But it's important. Um, I'm just going to turn it around for you so you can see how the backside looks like. And of course, in my case, you can see what I've done. I have cut off all the wires. So at the inside, you have a whole bunch of cables and you can see that the actual wiring loom has been modified and modified and modified all over again. Uh, that's just the way it is with old tractors. People keep changing things, keep adding things. But what you can see on the left hand side here is what we call the regulator. This is a leftover and was actually used for the dynamo. But as I said, my tractor doesn't have a dynamo anymore. So this box has totally no use. I'm going to replace this completely, get it out. I don't need it. And I will probably put a fuse box in place because most of the fuses that were done before were like floating fuses like this. Um, that doesn't look right anyway. Um, but the switches and also, they all still look quite all right. Uh, if you look close, you will even find some diodes. There's a small diode right here. You see that? I don't know if you can see it. That's important and you'll see that where this is going to be used. But as you can tell, it's been disconnected right now because the warning light for the hydraulic system, which is sitting, uh, let's see, over here, has been removed and it might actually be this one. I don't know. Well, I need to check. Uh, but I don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff anyway. We're going to completely disassemble it. Take all the wiring out and put new wiring in. And by the way, this is the flash uh, unit for the flashes or the blinkers. You can see it's been really been messed around with and, and done in a very, very bad way. So I'm going to start by taking out all the cabling now and then taking out all the dials and all the switches and clean it all up. To remove the RPM and the hour counter, that's not difficult. All you need to do is to undo these uh, brackets and then it will come off by itself. It slides off towards the front very easily. There we go. And here it is. So I'm going to put this aside, get it cleaned up. Next to remove are the gauges for the fuel and the temperature. This one right here is, I think it's the, yeah, the temperature gauge. It's the same mechanism to remove it from the housing. These little brackets or studs, I don't know what you call them. This is very easy if you take the dashboard out. If you try to do this with the dashboard in place, it's practical impossible and you will have for sure bleeding knuckles. I'm going to remove now all the cables and I don't care where they fit for the moment because I have a new wiring loom 
which may not fit at all actually, or partially fit. But we'll find out. And some of them are really tough to get open. But then again, they've been in this tractor for such a long time. Now the diode I need to keep, that's an important element, so I'm going to cut this guy off. That's very important. Um, this I will cut. I'm just going to cut, cut it loose now. It's easier to work on when this mess of cables is gone. Let's see what this flash unit is all about. So, it starts to clear up, doesn't it? Sometimes you need to let these things soak for a while. And then they come off very easily. Let's see if we can push this dial out. So now it's time to take the regulator out. I don't need this guy anymore. This is for the dynamo, as I said. And I have an alternator on mine, so... But it's the perfect spot to install a fuse box. It's even the original Lucas for a 12 volt system. So the dashboard is finally empty, as you can see. So now we can blast this dashboard and uh, sort it out because there's a couple of dents in there that I want to get out and then when all that is done um, we can remount the dials and the switches where they're supposed to be. Now while I was taking out a lot of these parts it didn't work always that easy. So you try to recuperate as much as you can but some of these switches these nuts were just stuck on it there was no way to get them off um, so I had to break them and luckily you can buy new ones for this they are not that expensive and in fact it's probably even better to buy new ones because the old ones were like kind of worn out anyway. And on the other side here I have the pile of cables, uh, the, the wiring loom that came out of the tractor. Um, so we are up for a little bit of work. But the good thing is we were able to recuperate some parts. I've got the regulator which I don't need in my case anymore but I just keep that aside and just maybe somebody can use it. The switch for the lights, that's still in a good condition. The flasher unit, the diode, and then I have some old lights here. I don't think I'm going to reuse them because I got new lights uh, to be installed and they are very cheap and you might as well go and buy them. And that's about all I could recuperate besides, of course, the uh, RPM counter, the fuel and the temperature meter uh, or the other way around I'm not sure yeah it's just the other way around temperature and fuel meter these are the old ones and these two are the new ones so I ordered two new ones just in case because I don't know if the old ones are still working or not and um, we'll test them out and see if it works or not and for those if you go into to replace the old dials with new dials you might as well get the proper sensor units that come with those new dials and here I have the two sensor units and of course I was able to recover the actual um, contact switch and over here I have a new wiring loom uh, to some extent. There's a lot of corrections that need to be done on this because it is not 100% accurate. Um, you can see these big connectors here uh, that typically connects to the wiring loom inside the dashboard uh, but I don't have that one so I will have to fix this in another way somehow. I'm probably going to use a connector block for that. I don't know yet. We'll see when, once we get that far. So let's start with checking out the dials. So we have two gauges on the David Brown. And before we get into the actual testing and the verification, a little explanation on how these gauges are working. Because both work the same way. What I have here on the board is a diagram of an actual gauge. And it doesn't really matter if it's a fuel gauge or if it is the um, temperature gauge. Because the mechanism is the same inside. What you find inside the gauge is of course the scale and a needle and the needle can pivot around this point. Now the needle will deflect to the left or to the right 
depending on the current that's flowing through coil 1 or coil 2. So there are two coils in sight. So now let's imagine that we have just turned on the contact uh, of the tractor and then the 12 volts right here from the battery will actually flow through the coil 1 and back to the ground or the negative side of the battery. That will create a magnetic field around this coil here which will pull the needle towards it. The second coil is also provided with 12 volts and a current will also flow through that coil and it will get to ground through the sensor. Now the sensor typically is what we call a variable resistor. So the resistance of this leg here or the sensor will vary depending on the temperature, depending on how much fuel there is in the gas tank and so on. So the current here in coil 1 is always what we call a permanent. It's a permanent current flowing through coil 1. It's a permanent magnetic field as well, so the needle will be at attracted to it or will deflect towards that direction. Now depending how much current flows through the secondary coil or the second coil, the needle might move more towards coil number two if the current flowing through this circuitry is stronger. So if the total path resistance between the plus 12 volts and the ground here is less resistant than the path of the current flowing through coil one. And this is how it works. So the main thing here is really the sensor that is determining the positioning of the needle. So as you can see, this is a very, very simple device. And on the actual gauge itself, you're not going to find a lot of connections. You will find a common plus 12 volt. And the 12 plus 12 volt is the same as that plus 12 volt. And then you will find another connector right here, which is the sensor. And that's all there is to it. So if you mount the gauge, you only have two connections, a plus 12 volt and a sensor connection. But keep in mind that you've got to make sure that the ground of the gauge itself is properly grounded to the battery. So I'm having the two gauges over here, the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge. Now that you know how it works, we're going to do a little test to show you that it's actually working. Now for that, you need to connect to one point of the dial, the plus 12 volts, as I've shown you in the diagram and on the other side you connect the ground. And of course you will need to have a sensor. Now I don't have a sensor right here but I'll show that to you in a few minutes uh, once we are back in the workshop where the tractor is. But I am using right now a potentiometer for that purpose. And a potentiometer is nothing more than a adjustable resistor and it's gonna simulate the sensor. So that's one way you can actually check the dial. So the purpose of this setup is to show you on how all this is working. Uh, but then we go back in the workshop and we'll show it to you actually with the real sensors on the tractor on how you can test it. So let's start. So here is one of the dials and you can see that the connectors that we have on there is one connector there and another connector. And it actually marks it. It says battery on this one and I know the text is upside down. And the other side says um, probe or sensor and that's where you would connect the cable going to the sensor. And that's basically it on these dials, what you need to have. Remember that you have to have a good ground on the dial uh, for it to work. So I have applied the power to the gauge. And now I'm going to adjust the potentiometer just like the temperature would increase. Uh, in other words, the resistance through the potentiometer is going to get less. So more current will flow to the coil number two. And you'll see that the needle will deflect on the gauge. I just need to turn it slowly. And you will see it going up. See how that moves up. And now we are at maximum. And we can turn it back as well. So this is how you can test actually your gauge with a potentiometer and on a workbench. But we'll do the same thing now uh, back in the garage where the tractor is. So testing the two gauges is exactly the same uh, because they are built on the same principle. So now we're going to go back into the barn and actually uh, start looking at the sensors on how you can check the sensors. And then we go in to connect the sensors really to the gauges and see how they work. You have to make sure that you have the correct mating sensor with it because, as I said, the current that flows through the primary coil or coil number one is fixed. 
and that's a certain amount. So you have to make sure that the current through coil number two is kind of calibrated uh, towards coil number one uh, in these gauges. So that's why sensors typically are matched to the dials themselves. So you cannot just any sensor uh, for any type of gauge. So typically you need to get those really aligned and matched. So with any further ado, let's go to the barn and uh, start showing you a couple more things on these gauges and the sensors. So we are back in the barn and the setup right now is we have the fuel gauge and I have my 12 volts battery. Now this is a power supply but you might as well use your own battery if you have one. And I kind of cabled up exactly the dial as we did in the lab before. Now what I have right here is the float which is inside the actual fuel tank and this is the sensor. And you can see the float will go up or down depending on the level in the fuel tank. And let me show you a close-up on how that mechanism is actually working. The sensor that is actually sitting inside the fuel tank with the float on is what we call a rheostat. And you see all these little lines there? In fact, all what that is is a variable resistor. So if the float goes up or down, you get more or less resistance. So more or less current will actually flow. So I'm going to turn on the power supply and then we'll pretend that the gas tank is empty. So the float is all the way in the bottom. I'm going to hold it like this and you can see that the dial or the gauge is empty. If the float goes up because we have more and more fuel coming in, you'll see that the dial is moving up until we have the float at full top level and our gauge shows full. So this is how this rheostat works, very similar to what we showed you in the lab. So this is a new sensor with the old dial and this is working just fine. So this is something you can verify on your old dial uh, by using a new sensor. But of course, if you don't have a new sensor, then you can also verify your old sensor. So the sensor or the float is located in the front of the gas tank and the little brass connector there is actually the lead that's going to your fuel gauge. Uh, I've placed the fuel gauge on top here just to show you. So if you're turning on the contact on your tractor and you see your fuel gauge completely deflecting to the right, which I'm now going to do, and you see it flipped all the way to the right, that is typically an indication that there is no connection between your fuel gauge and the actual sensor. So now let's hook that up and see what happens. So I'm going to hook up now the, the, the gauge to the sensor and you can actually see that the dial is now showing as good as empty. So it means that the sensor inside or the rheostat inside the gas tank is still working. Um, but I do know that my gas tank is not that empty. It's about half full, something like this. So I know this is not right. So the rheostat is probably having a little bit of an issue. I wouldn't be surprised if the float was actually leaking and it's sunk all the way down. So I'm going to try to lift up the float inside the gas tank and then you probably should see the difference. Uh, if that is the case, then we're going to take out the float and you can inspect the float and you can check it with an ohmmeter. But be careful if you take the float out, you have to undo these bolts here or nuts. Uh, if you do so um, and the tank is full, a lot of fuel will come out. So make sure that you drain the gas tank before you do that. At least the level is below the opening here because otherwise you're going to have a little bit of a mess. So I'm going to use a little hook to try to lift and move the float up and down a bit. Uh, so first of all we remove the cap and then see if we have access to the float. Um, keep an eye on the dial. All right, let me try to fish it. I think I got it. Now I can move it up and down and you can see it does work. So I think this float is still working uh, but it probably is leaking so it's not sitting at the right side anymore. So um, it doesn't indicate the proper level. In fact, I have about, if I look on the tank, I have about that much. That's where it should be about. It should be about right here. And I think it's very sensitive. Uh, so I think this rheostat has a lot of wear and tear and is not really working anymore properly. So we're going to replace it. Another way to verify that your float is still working is by taking it out of the tractor, but be aware that you may have fuel coming out. So first of all, drain the fuel before you do so, and then place it on a bench and use an ohmmeter and connect the positive lead of the ohmmeter towards 
the sensing clip. This is this one right here. This is this wire actually. And then the return uh, towards the frame of the sensor. And then turn on your ohm meter and place it on low ohms because this is not a lot of ohms. There we go. So right now we have 37 ohms. Because right now the indication we have is for a full tank. So we have a lot of resistance, so low current. And if I now lower the float, you see how the um, resistance drops on the counter, on the meter. And, you know, it's going down normally. It doesn't go in spurts. It doesn't jump back up and down because that would be an indication that your float is really bad. And now uh, we are at the lowest point and the tank is what we call empty. And the resistance is very low, so we have a high current. So now the needle would deflect to the empty part uh, of the dial. And this is how this is supposed to work. See, it goes up very nicely. It doesn't jump down. A worn out rheostat will actually jump back and forth and you're not going to have a proper reading. And here is our famous temperature sensor. So we're going to hook it up and then try it out by heating it up in advance. Uh, you can use a glass of water, hot water or something like this, or a heat gun, whatever you want and then heat it up and you should see that the temperature on your gauge should go up. So we hooked up the temperature meter in exactly the same way. So the plus from the battery onto the plus of the meter and then the sensing wire, which is the red one here, is going to the temperature sensor, which is normally fitted in the um, thermostat housing. And then we return it back to the ground. So that's the setup. The resistance of this sensor will change depending on the temperature. I have it now heated up. Uh, so let me cool that down a bit and then see. Uh, but you'll see as soon as it cools down that the meter will actually go down. Right, so I'm going to try to spray a bit of liquid on it so it's going to go down a bit. And if you want to check your temperature sensor which is on the thermostat housing right here, then disconnect the wire that is going to your gauge. Connect one lead of your ohm meter to it and then connect the other lead of the ohm meter to the ground. And if the tractor is cold, then you should have around 1.3 kilo ohm uh, on your ohm meter. Um, if the engine is going to warm up, then that resistance should drop. Now, I'm not going to start the engine, but I'm just going to use a heat gun to show you what the effect will be. So I'm going to heat that up, but you guys need to keep an eye on this ohm meter and see how the resistance uh, is going to go down. Let me put my glasses on and then it'll heat that up a little bit. So, it takes a little bit to get the heat going, but you can see it's starting to drop, right? Uh, so it's going down, so the warmer it gets, the lower the resistance becomes, so the more the deflection of the meter will be because it will be more current. There you go. So now you know that this sensor is actually working. And as you can see, it's keep going down because the heat is still on there and the sensor is now actually still warm. Uh, it's going to take a while before it cools down again, but this is how you can check the sensor on your tractor without removing it. A very simple test with a no meter. So I'm going to try to cool it down a bit with a spray and then the resistance should go up again. So let's see. Right, I've done it. And you can see, because I'm cooling it down, it's picking up again, so the resistance is going up again. That's the way to check uh, your temperature sensor. And as you can see, it's slowly building back up where it started while it's cooling down. As you have seen, checking the gauges isn't very difficult, and checking the sensors isn't very difficult either. But we have a couple of more things on the dashboard and these are the warning lights. We have like three warning lights. There is a oil pressure warning light, there is a hydraulics uh, vacuum uh, warning light and there is a um, charge light uh, so the battery isn't getting charged. So we're going to have to look on all these three lights on how they work. So let's start with the warning light for the oil pressure. I have the red light here but it could be any color, I just wanted to show you what it is and next to that I actually have the sensor. I'm having the warning light connected to the plus 12 volts of my battery. The other side of the warning light is going to the sensor in the back here 
and then I have the ground of the tractor going back to the battery. And this is the sensor, and it's nothing really special, it is just the pressure switch. And the oil pressure sensor is sitting right on top of your oil filter, and that's where you normally connect the lead going to your oil warning light. So you see the little hole in the front, that's where the oil pressure will come in, and it will push a contact inside. So under normal circumstances, when the engine is not running, the light should be on. So let me turn on the battery. And as you can see, now the light is on because the contact inside this sensor is now closed. As soon as we get some pressure while the engine is running, you'll see that the light will go off. Now, how do we simulate this? Well, I'm going to put some pressure into it with my air compressor uh, around 1.5 to 2 bar. That should be more than enough. Don't overpressurize it because then you may destroy the sensor. And then you should see that the light goes off. So let me try to hook up this hose and not being in the way of the camera. There you go. See? The light goes off and as soon as I remove the pressure, the light comes back on. So that's a very easy test to verify your oil pressure sensor. There we go. Sorry, the clip jumped off. So now how do you check this sensor when it's on your tractor? Well, take an ohmmeter and connect it to the chassis of your tractor on one side, and the other side of the ohmmeter goes to this pin right here. And you should have continuity, so there should be a short circuit between the two. That's all there is to it. And then once the tractor is running, the ohmmeter should show an open connection, because then the light will go off. Pretty simple, isn't it? So we're going to talk about the alternator. And in your case, that might actually be a dynamo, because it depends a bit what you have fitted on your tractor. This was originally a dynamo, but I did replace it with an alternator, because they're a bit more efficient and you need less circuitry. So before we get on to the alternator, I just want to give you a little explanation what the alternator is doing. The alternator is this whole area right here. This is the charge light, which is on your dashboard, and your contact switch. And of course you have your battery sitting right here. The alternator has two main parts. It has what we call a rotor in the middle and there's some contact rings there and there are coils on that. And then you have a fixed part which is surrounding the rotor which we call the stator. And again these are windings. Now an alternator is delivering AC current, alternating current. And we do know that a battery is direct current or DC current. So somehow, whenever the alternator is generating power, we'll have to convert AC to DC. And that's the function of the rectifier. It's a set of diodes built inside your alternator that will rectify the alternating current to direct current, so it can actually charge the battery or provide feed to your lights and so on. So the way this works is very simple. The moment that you turn on the contact right here, this charge light will lit up. It goes on. And then current will actually flow from the battery through the system, into the rotor, through the slip rings, through those windings, and then back to ground. So now the rotor on all its windings is now creating a magnetic field because of that current that flows through the system. The moment that you crank up the engine, this rotor will start spinning around. That will cause an induction in the stator and the windings in the stator will generate AC current. So that AC current will be generated by all of these stators and it will come into the rectifier and now the rectifier will actually rectify that to DC. Now the DC voltage is going to go back to the battery and you know ideally you should have around 14.4 volts to charge the battery. And that voltage is monitored right here by the regulator. And the regulator will check on this voltage here so that it's more or less stable. So for instance, if your battery was really drained, you're going to need a lot of current to charge it up. And if you draw more current, then obviously the alternator has to produce more current. And the way to do that is by increasing here the current that flows through the rotor. And this is the role of the regulator. That's what the regulator will do. And the other way around, if you have no more load on the tractor, so your highlights are off and, and you basically your battery is all fully filled up, 
then less current is needed to maintain the battery charge. And then, of course, if less is needed, then we can lower the current through the rotor. And this is the whole function of the regulator to control the voltage uh, in regards to a current demand. So really, if the voltage is too low, then more current will be provided through the rotor and if the voltage is too high then less current will be provided. There are many things that affect this, for instance the RPMs of the rotor, how fast the rotor is running and of course the load that you have on the tractor. So this is a very very simple system and very easy to explain. One important factor is that the charge light you have to pay attention that your charge light is not blown. If that bulb is blown, then you will never get a charge and the charge light will be off. And you will think, or you will think that you have, that you are charging the battery, but you are not. So always make sure that the uh, charge light bulb is intact. Now, how do you check this? Well, very simple. Turn on the contact and then take a voltmeter and go to the regulator and measure that point and there you should see the plus 12 volts from your battery. If you don't see it, then the circuitry between your charge light and the regulator is faulty. And the other check you can do is once the engine is running, then you should check for the 14.4 volts that the regulator is working. Uh, you actually can put more or less load on your battery by turning on the lights or removing the lights or running on a flat battery and, and so on. And you should always retain more or less the same voltage towards the battery to charge, no matter what the demand is. If you see fluctuation in this, then most likely you have a problem with the regulator. Uh, and if you don't even get the voltage properly, you may even have a problem with the rectifier uh, itself. Maybe one of the diodes is blown and things like this. So a very si simple system to check. So now let's go to the real tractor and uh, see how we can do this. As you know, I have removed all the cabling on this tractor, so I had to cheat a little bit to show you on how you can troubleshoot your alternator. Um, I have taped up the dashboard charge light onto the alternator and I connected it towards the 12 volts of the battery, which is the black wire right here. Now, I know it should be red, but okay, it's a black one. And that's my 12 volt feeds to my um, light bulb. And then the return of the light bulb or the output of it is going to my alternator. This is the lead that is going to feed the rotor with current, or at least the initial feed. Um, so the light will come on as soon as I turn on the contact. Now, I don't have a contact key anymore, so I will be using uh, the board on my battery, and I will connect my battery, and then you see the light will come on. And then the thick red wire, well, there is nothing special to that. That's the output of the alternator, so that's where we will find the 14.4 volts. Hopefully, if this alternator is in a good working condition and while the engine is running, of course. So the first thing I'm going to do now is turn on the contact and the red light should come on. And then we'll measure the voltage uh, right there on the alternator because that would be the first test for you to make sure that you have actually voltage coming to the alternator. And as you can see, we only have two connectors on the alternator. The two big spades here uh, are the same, and this is the output, and it's a little spade underneath, which is actually the um, feed coming from your dashboard light. The black box right here, this is your actual uh, regulator. The diodes are inside, I can't show you those. But let me turn on the contact now, and then the light should come on. And now we got the light on, so now you could take your voltmeter, in essence, and actually go and measure the small connector at the bottom of your alternator. So this is the wire coming from your charge light. So let's see what voltage we have on it. So disconnect it first and measure it towards the ground. And what I see is I have about 12.7 volts, which is my battery charge. It's always good to remove this cable and just check it on the cable itself. And then connect it and measure again and you should see a voltage drop. Uh, so that indicates that the rotor is actually being fed. So now the next thing we're going to do is to check the output of the alternator. Now to start up the engine I need to do a little trick guys because I have everything removed so let me start it like this and then we'll come back to it. All right so now the engine is running but the voltage that we have is probably very low. 
know, it's about 12.56 volts. And that is because we don't have enough RPMs. So I'm gonna crank up the engine a bit so the circuit is triggered. As you can see, the light is now turned off. And I think we're now gonna have the right voltage. So let's check it out. We got about 13 and a half volts because it's now running pretty low on RPMs, but that's good. I have cranked up the RPMs and now we're going to check and see what the voltage is. So I expect around 14.4 volts. And that's about right, 14.8 volts. So I know this is working just fine. So that was the check of the actual charge circuitry on your David Brown. And we also will talk about the starter motor and the solenoid on top. Now in fact, a tractor like this, all what you need is a battery, a starter motor and an alternator. And that's all you need to crank up the engine. You don't need no complex wire loom, no switches, nothing of that. All what you need is plus 12 volts to your starter, the solenoid and then bridge that to the contact of the solenoid and it will kick in the solenoid, the starter will start running, it will crank over the engine and then the engine will run and your alternator will start producing power. But don't let it run free, uh, connect it up to the battery, that's important. Here we have the starter motor and again, this is a very simple device. We have a solenoid on top of it and the solenoid is a electromagnet in essence which will move forward as soon as you apply power to it and you need to trigger it from this little pin right here. This is the plus 12 volts from the battery to feed the solenoid, not for the starter motor but for the solenoid. And then here you have the trigger pin to trigger actually the starter. And then the big cable is actually the cable that will make contact to the starter motor as soon as the solenoid is uh, activated. Now, the solenoid has two purposes. It has the purpose of providing uh, power to the starter motor, but also to move the Bendix forward. So when the solenoid is activated, it's gonna move the tooth wheel inside on the starter motor onto the flywheel. Um, and if that is uh, not grabbing from the right moment in time, there's like a two-stage approach on this one. It will apply even more power to it and then it will jump in. So that's why you have inside the solenoid two contacts. Uh, and of course, there is a ground cable for the starter motor because you have to have current coming through. Now, if you want to start an engine like this uh, without any cabling, the only thing you're going to need is, of course, a battery. And you need a feed to the solenoid. You need a feed uh, to the uh, solenoid itself for the actual starter motor and all what you need to do is trigger this little pin here with a cable and then it will actually start up. So uh, I'm just going to do that for you so you will see it. So this connector here is also plus 12 volts the same as that one they're all on the same connector so I'm going to connect it and then we'll see. There you go. Now I have not uh, engaged the engine so it cannot start because otherwise it's going to make too much noise. So that's how simple that is. So even uh, if you think uh, that your tractor is safe because you took the key off uh, out of the contact, it's not because everybody can start it like this. So folks, this is it for this episode of the big cleanup of the David Brown. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and I think we covered most of the electrical circuits that are important on this tractor. The one that I did not cover is the vacuum switch, which is underneath the tractor. Um, but I'll cover that once we start cabling everything back up and when everything is sprayed and when we start to reassemble the tractor. Now in the next episode, I'm going to spray the engine and spray the fenders and then we should be able to put it all back together and hopefully get the mower in the back because initially I was planning to have the mower in the front. I won't say mower, I actually mean a head trimmer. I'm not going to mount it on the front because the Chinese head trimmer that I had before, I sold it and I got a new one which is going to go in the back. So, have a great day and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.